pastors here at Grace Baptist Church because what we want for our people is what Jesus wants for his people, to know greater joy by stepping into the areas that bring no greater joy than being a 24-7 worshiper, being a go person, and being an alongsider. And so I am uh, Ryan Adkins, associate pastor here at Grace. Sitting across from me today is... Steve Strong, lead pastor here at Grace. And to my left is uh, a man that we owe a huge thanks to, Dan Craniak, who is... Uh, making us sound better, uh, hopefully making us sound smarter, and unfortunately he can't make us look any better, uh, <laughs> but he is a, a producing this podcast for us and just uh, really helping us to get this thing off the ground and out of our minds and into the airwaves. So huge thanks to you, Dan. Dan the man. That's right. And so today we're going to be talking about uh, kind of working through a grid of spiritual growth categories. And so we're going to introduce the idea today, and then we've got four categories to walk through. And so, Steve, if you want to take us kind of into the idea of why do we need to talk about a grid? Why do we need to think through this topic? Well, I think uh, God's called us to be what we call here alongsiders, where we, last year, we tried to hammer this home, being bound together, where we're taking ownership of each other's spiritual growth, and so we're coming alongside. We are asking others, or being intentional about coming alongside to say, hey, let's walk toward Christ. And, and sometimes when we think about spiritual growth, it can be a uh, just this massive umbrella of topics and ideas. What does this look like? What is spiritual growth? Um, you even think about a person's life, just, you know, 80 years. There's so much that happens in 80 years in a person's own just kind of growth. And so trying to put a grid and just trying to provide some categories. So how can I, how do I come alongside someone? Mm -hmm. What do I need to be looking for? How do I, how do I help another person grow? And I think it's important in trying to answer that question and to be effective as an alongsider is, well, I need to understand where this other person is. Where are they in the course of their own spiritual growth? Um, and so I think talking about this, providing this kind of, first of all, just provides some categories that we can kind of uh, kind of work with, work out of when it comes to our alongsiding relationships. Um, how are we evaluating where people are? And I kind of hesitate using the word evaluating because mm -hmm. it, it can have a negative connotation where we're being judgmental it's not right. it's not trying to be judgmental of people but just all right where are they yeah recognizing where yeah you're at. recognizing where they are you know take just people in general you see you see ages we see it mm -hmm. and there you recognize it um and you we put age groups to people we have it at our church we have kids ministry mm -hmm. we have student ministry and we have adult ministries so these are just categories, and there are some general characteristics in age groupings, mm -hmm. and I think there are general characteristics in our spiritual growth, mm -hmm. all right? And so just trying to put some categories to what those stages are, mm -hmm. and I think it can be helpful for us. Um, I think it's also helpful to try to narrow down what those categories are, because we oftentimes, as Christians, live unevaluated Christian lives. Right. Uh, it's one of the reasons we challenge our people to be intentional in kind of setting up a quarterly spiritual growth plan mm -hmm. where we're setting goals. So we live unevaluated Christian lives. So I need to be more intentional. And I think this having these kind of categories when we are trying to help another person grow, or even myself, mm -hmm. um, can be a useful and kind of helpful tool. Um, and I think it's important because this, <clears throat> when you think about another person, their own spiritual growth, this is what God's doing in their life. Um, God's primary work in a person's life is not What's, what's going on economically with them, what's going on in their career, uh, what's going on interpersonally, 
you know, God's primary work is their Christ likeness, mm-hmm. their spiritual growth. Every one of those other contexts is a context for that. Mm-hmm. And so let's zero in on what that might look like. Now, one kind of caveat to trying to categorize spiritual growth in a process is no matter what kind of grid that we use, nobody fits perfectly in the grid. Right. So spiritual growth is a up and down. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's ultimately an upward Christ-likeness kind of trajectory, but that trajectory has ups and downs. Yeah. And so like there there's back and forth, there's ups and downs, there's wavering, there's excelled growth. I mean, you know, uh, so it, you can't perfectly plot somebody that people aren't that way. Life is not that way, but it doesn't take away from the benefit that maybe having some kind of grid mm-hmm. or rubric or classification or something to just provide some workable categories that give a, a helpful description of that stage, some goals for that stage, and what's what are we longing for, and how do we move them to the next? Stage, mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's, and they're not like there's four categories, but it's not four bins that you put people in That's because right. it's a spectrum. There's there's going to be as we kind of work through it, you'll you'll hear there's different responses uh, to a different couple of different things that these <laughs> people like in these categories show. And I think you can see a change in some responses in one category, but not necessarily in the other two. Sure. And so they're moving along that spectrum, but not necessarily in the next category, if you will, or hit the next mile marker. But in general, there will be a certain forward movement. Yes. Yep. At different paces, perhaps, mm-hmm. in different areas. Um, but it does give us maybe something tangible and workable when, hey, I need to come alongside someone. Mm-hmm. What what's my goal for them? Yeah, yep. Maybe as you think that makes good that. sense. So we have four categories. We're going to work through uh, first, kind of in working order here: natural, carnal, spiritual, and then spiritual leader. And so, Steve, kind of what are some of the things we're going to look at in each of those as we talk about a, a, a natural person? Yeah. So in general, with each one, so that that kind of forward moving progress is the order that you just gave natural carnal spiritual and then a spiritual leader um natural in general we're talking about someone who has no spiritual life and so it's a natural person they're they're spiritually dead if you will um but then the next three carnal spiritual and spiritual leader I think it, maybe it's helpful just to think about the three categories that we mentioned earlier when we were talking about our, our own ministries at Grace. You know, just think about the physical growth and maturation that happens. The carnal would be, you know, your infant and your children, your spiritual category. You're thinking about this, you know, the adolescent and young adult years of our lives. And the spirituality, or the spiritual leader is that adult that adult person, mm-hmm. all right? And so physically, we, in general, we grow. It happens. Mm-hmm. Um, spiritually, God is moving. And, right? and so you have these four categories, natural, carnal, spiritual, spiritual leader. And I think it's probably worth mentioning that, you know, we're, we have this written down, kind of laid out on paper, mm-hmm. and uh, we will we'll have copies of this and make this available um, it's probably something that we'll work with our life group leaders with. Um, but so we do have this and we can, and so if you would, any of our people would like a copy of this, we will make it available and to reward those that are listening. If they ask, maybe we'll have like a candy bar or something. So anyway, but we like to reward our people with candy. Food's always a great motivation. But because Dan is here, everybody, anybody not named Dan Cranier yeah, yeah. can can get rewarded with this. So So anyway, so we have these four (laughs) categories, natural, carnal, spiritual, spiritual leader. 
And I think what we're going to do is, like, I think with this episode, we're going to take one at a time. Yep. You know, natural. We're going to talk about that during this episode. And then we'll take three more and just kind of look at each of those three. And so as we look at them, then we're going to look at, all right, so what are some of the key characteristics or what are their responses to three main things? So in each category, how how does a person in this category respond to the Word of God? How does this person respond to God himself? How does this person respond to sin? All right. And so what are the responses to those three? What are the goals that we need to have for these for a person within this general category? And and then how what are things that we can do to help them reach those goals? All right. So in each category, what is what's a person in this category? How are they responding to the word of God? How are they responding to God Himself? How are they responding to sin? What are the goals that we need to have for them, and how can we reach those goals? Mm-hmm. And those goals and those aims are really trying to move them forward in this process into the next category to a spiritual leader. So, yeah. All right, so let's hop into the first category then, and that's natural or dead. Yep. And so, um, Steve, what would be like a general description? Like how would you generally describe these individuals? So I think it's, you know, there is some scriptural kind of precedent in talking about or um, categorizing them as a natural person, a dead, spiritual deadness. Um, A couple of the verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, you know, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, they're folly to him. That person is not able to understand them because they those things are spiritually discerned and there's no spiritual life in that person. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. I'm not going to read all of these, but there's a <clears throat> statement in there that just talks about, you know, the believers not living life as the Gentiles or those that, are, that have no spiritual life, uh, those that are far from God, those that don't have spiritual life, their understanding is darkened. It says they're alienated from the life of God Mm -hmm. because the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of heart. Ephesians chapter 2, this is, you know, most of our people are familiar with this. You were dead Dead. in your trespasses and sins. Um, Colossians 1, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness. And then Colossians 2 verse 13, and you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Um, and so there's spiritual deadness. So I think a general description, the key idea, and probably the best way to describe those in this category is is death, not fear, not physical death, but think in terms of physical death. I think, you know, you think about not to be morbid, but a body that doesn't have physical life is not a person. It's just there. It's not doing anything. There's no evidence of life. And spiritually, that visually illustrates spiritually what is there. Think of, think of Adam as God was creating, and he formed Adam from the dust of the ground. Picture God just kind of with, you know, taking the dust, taking the dirt, and if we were had our little Wayback Machine, <laughs> and we went back to the very first, the sixth day, we stood off to the side, and maybe we saw Jesus in a physical manifestation stooping down, taking the dirt, and forming what would become a human body. And But that human body just laid there. There was no life. And then he breathed life into that body. And then Adam, you know came to life. He, mm-hmm. he had the energy. He was responding, and he could see, and he, uh, it's everything, every person around him. Um, but before God breathed life, there was just physical, there was, it was lifeless. Mm-hmm. There was no response. You could push it, you could touch it, you could pinch it, and there's just no response. There's no interaction. Um, and I think that translates spiritually, that even though you have a living person, there is a spiritual deadness to them. There's, there's no recognition. There's no interaction. There's no appreciation. There's just no response. So 
think in general, think in those terms mm-hmm. when we think about where a person is when they're in this category. All right, so let's go into those three kind of characteristics, those responses. So, all right, what is this individual's response to uh, the word? Yeah, so when we think about the spiritually dead person, their response to the word of God, well, there's no light. There's no understanding. Uh, the things of God, Paul says in our First Corinthians, is that the heart and the mind of God is spiritually discerned. Mm-hmm. In other words, there needs to be a spiritual life, and he's given us the Holy Spirit to understand the heart and mind of God. It, and not just to understand it, but to, to own it. All right. And so the spiritually dead person doesn't accept the things of God, doesn't welcome them. He doesn't receive them. She's not tolerating, not approving them. Why? Because Paul says they're foolishness to them. It's foolish. It's folly. It's wildly unfounded. And so I think we can, we're beginning to kind of see this in our culture. Mm -hmm. The positions in the that that we have as God's people when we hold the word of God to be true our positions are just wildly unfounded and they're not accepted and that kind of is growing and growing mm-hmm. a temptation for us and this is a rabbit trail temptation is well we don't want the world to think us as foolish so we need to fill in the blank yeah. and i you know um not so. We need to hold to the Word of God. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's just no understanding. I think a couple other... Um, it, not understanding doesn't mean that they, they can't read John 3.16 and have a mental... Okay, God loved the world. But when we think about understanding, thinking about the meaning of it, there is... There's a veil there. There's a darkening that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, and, the, and the God of this world is blinded. So mm-hmm. I, it's not like they can't read John 3.16, but they're not going to respond right. to John 3.16. Oh, yeah, God loves the world, but that has no bearing on my life. So there, there's a deadness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not an appreciation for it, mm-hmm. if if that makes sense, and then, and the more that there's a non-response, and we're going to see this as we start studying through Romans chapter one, there's just a continued suppressing mm-hmm. of the word of God and of the truth, where there's just a continued rejection, a pushing away to suppress something is to push it down. You push it down. You push it down. You push it down. You push it down. So that's that is their response to the word of God. Mm-hmm. It almost makes me think. In my mind, I'm going to like if you're at an art gallery and you can see that there's a painting on the wall, but the room is dark, you can't see the beauty of that painting. And instead of turning the lights up, you're just turning the lights down. Yes. And so just that idea of suppressing and just dimming it, darkening it, um, that's that's the visual that as you were just speaking, that's what was coming to mind. Yeah. And and maybe, you know, our people are or those that are listening to this are like, well then then I can't use the word of God. You know, so if there's no understanding, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use the scriptures as a part of my witness because we want there to be spiritual life. So Mm -hmm. does that mean don't use the Bible when you're trying to share Christ? No, it doesn't. It means use the Bible because Mm -hmm. just with Adam there in the garden of Eden, breathing life, you know, God had to breathe life. He brought life. He made them alive and there was understanding. God is going to, he uses the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit to awaken and to make mm-hmm. life and to give that understanding. Now, that's a whole other episode to talk about, <laughs> okay, how does that all work? And anyway, but that to breathe life, God will use the scriptures. So don't shy away from using the mm-hmm. scriptures, but understand, I think what happens is in their response to the word of God, it shows... Well, I, I can't breathe. I can't give a person life. I'm totally dependent upon God to do this. 
And so um, really take some of the load off of our shoulders Mm -hmm. that, wow, I have the weight on my shoulder that I have to convince them. I have to... No. We can't make them alive. No, They're can't. dead. They're we dead. can't make them alive. And God uses the scriptures and in the power of the Holy Spirit, he can do that. And so I, d- I continue. Anyway, mm-hmm. So we, we can keep moving through here. This, this. Yep. All right, so that's, that's their response to God's word. What about their response to God himself? How would you describe that? Uh, there's no evidence. You know, uh, is there a sense, oh, yeah, there may be a God, but there's not a sense of, well, they refuse to come to Jesus. Mm-hmm. They refuse to, we, okay, think about the Pharisees. Think about those in Jesus' day. Um, you think about, I'm trying to, Jesus was, I think it's in John chapters like 7, 8, 9, and 10. And they see Jesus, they recognize Jesus, they hear the words that he's saying, and you have a series of events where he's feeding the 5,000, and he's teaching his disciples a lesson, and feeds them, there's leftover food, he sends the disciples off into the boat, he goes up on a mountain to pray by himself, he comes to them at night, and he's walking on the water, uh, Peter goes out and he begins to sink and Jesus lifts him back up. Um, and I think it's Mark that comments on that, that this whole moment there on the water during the night was because the disciples didn't learn the lesson uh, of the bread, of the loaves and the fish. Um, but Jesus gets in the boat and I think John even said, like immediately they're on the other side. They get to the other side, and that whole crowd from the 5,000 is there with Jesus again. And so they recognize Jesus, and then Jesus begins to teach something that is difficult. Um, and he begins to use language like, you know, I gave you the bread and the fish, but you need to eat me. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you want to have life, you have to eat me. You have to partake of my, of me. And they're like, no, that's, no. <laughs> um, and so you have this darkening. I think we see illustrated the darkening of the mind. They hear what he's saying, but there's not an acceptance of it. And, and we're told that a lot of those disciples leave Jesus. And it's like, because these sayings are hard. Not hard in the, man, I can't wrap my round, my mind around that math equation. I just don't get it. Hard in the sense of, we don't want it. Right. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, all right, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter's like, no, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Like, we know who you are mm-hmm. and we're not leaving you. And so the response to who God is. Oh, yeah, we'll hear. I hear what you're saying. But there's a turning and a walking away. Mm -hmm. So there's no response to him. And I think a person in this category, and that's, and again, this is not a, you know, a description of, I've never heard of God. I've never heard of Jesus. But what have you done with God? Mm Mm-hmm. Is it, I can't go anywhere else. It's with you. And, and, and I'm being drawn. That's a person with spiritual life. We'll get to that. But I mean, the spiritually dead person walks away from their creator mm-hmm. and rejects. And the more you walk away, the more you just continue to refuse him. Mm-hmm. So, All right. So what about their response? the natural person and their response to sin. All right. So as we're evaluating the people in our lives, what is, you know, how are they responding to the word of God? How are they responding to God himself? Can they just easily walk away? Are they refusing? And I think we're also looking at, all right, so how, what is their response to sin? Um, Well, first of all, we see in Romans one that 
in the spiritually dead person, sin just continues to progress. Mm -hmm. So it continues to just, you know, sin has one of the characteristics of sin, and we've talked about this, I've mentioned this in sermons, is that sin is always reaching for its greatest expression. All right. So anger is always reaching for murder. Mm. Lust is always reaching toward adultery and immorality. All right. And so the spiritually dead person, sin just continues to progress. All right. Um, and it, and that's not to say that every spiritually dead person is going to become a murderer. Right. But it, it continues. And the fact that it doesn't is just the common grace of God. Hmm. All right. Um, um, the following, and I, I think first John, John really kind of paints this picture of the, the course of this world. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Like that's the course of this world. That's the defining nature of this world. And a spiritually dead person, think of think of the a current on a river. All right. At the heart of this river and the water is this kind of sinfulness that is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the movement. All right. And the spiritually dead person is in that current and, and just kind of moving along. So what is right is wrong, what's right is stained, it's ruined. Um, and there's a and so as you're moving, as that flow in a person's life, there really is a callousness, I think. And I think that's what Ephesians 4.19 is talking about, where there's just a callousness toward righteousness. And and, and the spiritually dead person is just giving themselves over to sensuality and to greed. And so, or just kind of a greediness toward impurity, I think is what he says, or what he writes. And so there's really not a resistance to sin. And if there is a resistance to sin, it's for their own benefit. Or because if I'm, so I'm not going to lie because that's not going to help me meet my career goals. Mm Mm-hmm. But what is that? That's also kind of a, a pride of life. And so yeah. my resistance to sin is really because of a more accepted cultural sin, yeah. if you will. Still, still for self. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so like Micah 7 says, uh, Micah 7, 3 talks about, uh, of course, God's people rejecting God, but they get, they get, skilled at doing what's wrong. They they do evil well. If, and then Paul would kind of run off of that. Romans 6, 19, talks, or 16, 19 talks about, you know, we need, as God's people, we need to be wise to what is good and innocent to evil. Innocent to evil in the sense that I'm not skilled at doing what's wrong. <laughs> so the spiritually dead person, the opposite is true really is natural, is that a person is innocent to what's good. So, like, a person who is innocent in the sense that, you know, innocent to technology is a is a sense of, I, I really don't know anything about technology. I, I don't get it. You know, the spiritually dead person is is innocent in that sense toward what is good. And Paul says... God's people, we need to be innocent toward what is evil. Like, mm. I just don't get it. I'm not skilled at doing what's evil, all right? Whereas the natural person is innocent towards what's good, and they're wise to evil. They're, they're, they're good at satisfying their sinful cravings and aspirations. Mm-hmm. And I think Paul just, in Romans 6, puts it in the sense that when that's the case, Sin is reigning. Sin has that dominion in their life. They're a slave to their sin. Um, so I hope that's not confusing, but I, yeah. I, I think in a, in a sense that um, their response to sin is a person in this category, they're wise to it. 
So anyway. Yeah, they're wise to that evil. Mm-hmm. All right, so what are some goals? What as As we are seeking to connect with these individuals and see movement, what are some of the goals that we should have? Well, I think this is probably the most natural for us as believers in saying, all right, what goal do we have for them? We obviously want them to have spiritual life. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Because they're dead. We need God to spiritually resurrect them. Excuse me, like like Lazarus in the gar- in the tomb. You know, we need mm-hmm. God to just breathe and to speak and to call them out. And so that's our role as go persons. Yep. You know, this is my aim with a person who is spiritually dead. And these are the three that we have. In our ping pong ball display, these are the mm-hmm. these are the ones that we're trying to be intentionally in developing relationships. We need to be praying for them every single day because our aim is that there would be spiritual life, is that God would, as He says in Ephesians chapter two, that God would make them alive. Our goal for them is not, well, we want them to be better people, right? We want them to be happy. No, we they need spiritual life. Because if they die spiritually dead, they're separated from God for eternity in hell. And I don't want that from them. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't want that for them. And so our goal is spiritual life. So how does so how do we do that? Probably is the next question. Well, all these episodes that we've talked, you know, about being a go person, about intentionally mm-hmm. reaching people, we're, we're chal- it's our aim and our theme for this year. It's why we provide this uh, the my circle training. Um, we just need to be building intentional relationships with people, sharing the gospel. We need to become involved in their lives. Um, we need to, we need to serve them. We need to love them. Uh, we can meet some of their felt needs, but that's not the aim. You know, that's not the end goal. The end goal is to be able to present the gospel. We need to teach the gospel with the aim to persuade them that God would take the truth of his word and that they would accept, they need to accept Jesus Christ. And mm-hmm. so we need to do everything that we can to reach them and to see them come to, to come to Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's, that go person aspect of this, you know, the, the whole overall theme of this chart is alongsiding, alongsiding. but this first category is really, uh, it's evangelism, not walking with. Yeah, that's their goal. In, that's but the, it's helpful to understand that as I'm being a go person to them, uh, th- this to be real, this is where there's spiritual deadness mm-hmm. there. And what can I expect? And my only goal is the gospel. Mm-hmm. So, And I think this plays with, if you think about the Great Commission, it's not go and make converts, it's go and make disciples. Go and, and that, make disciples. It's that, okay, so if you... You know, God blesses you, and you are involved with someone's salvation, and you're there, and you're present, and you're you know you're helping as that go person. You're serving in that way. Now, here are the next steps, and we'll see those in these subsequent episodes as we go through these other categories. And yeah, it's just a yeah because go and make disciples, teaching them to obey mm-hmm. everything that I've commanded you. Yeah, and that's you know I think that's the aim. We would love for every one of our people. This year, you know, and uh, the My Circle training, be praying every day mm-hmm. for one of the spiritually dead people in your life, the natural people. Be praying every single day. Once a, I think it's a week, do something to intentionally engage with them. Mm-hmm. And then try to have one spiritual conversation with them a month. Mm-hmm. You know, I, if our people were doing that, the, those My Circle aims and goals... Wouldn't it be amazing if every one of our people was able to lead someone to Christ Mm -hmm. and then they can step into, we see them step out of this natural category. Now they're this infant in Christ, this carnal, and and walk them through. That's the joy of a go person now becoming the joy of an alongsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a, it would be an amazing, our church would be, there would be an energy and a fire yeah, it would be a pretty amazing thing. Yep. Yeah, so. well, let's all be working and praying towards that end. And, Absolutely. And just focusing on who God has placed in our, our lives that need to 
be made alive. Absolutely. And to be praying for them and, and focused upon them this year. And so uh, that Amen. that's a great conversation to kick off this series here. And so let's go ahead and end it there. And we'll be coming back in our next episode. We'll be talking about the next category, and that's a carnal person. Uh, so until then, uh, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. Yep, God bless. <laughs>